Okay, so, uh, welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing personalised cancer medicine. Okay, so we're in the process of discussing examples of drugs which have a taste of the concept of pharmacogenomics and personalised cancer medicine in the way that they are prescribed at the moment. Okay, but as I've stressed multiple times already, personalised cancer medicine is still an aspiration at the moment. These are little snippets of where we're beginning to start the process towards personalised cancer medicine. Okay, right, so we've just looked at trastuzumab, which is a drug used to treat certain forms of breast cancer where that form of breast cancer specifically has overactivity in this protein HER2, and it's this overactivity in this receptor, HER2, uh, which drives the cells to overproliferate. Okay, and trastuzumab or Herceptin is a uh, monoclonal antibody that binds to a specific epitope on the HER2 receptor and effectively is a very fancy competitive antagonist. It blocks the epidermal growth factor, EGF, from being able to bind to the HER2 receptor and being able to trigger the cancer cells to overproliferate, and therefore it stops the uh, breast cancer cells overproliferating. But this drug is only useful in breast cancer cells where HER2 is driving the overproliferation. In forms of breast cancer where it's not driving the overproliferation, then trastuzumab is not going to be effective. And therefore, before prescription of trastuzumab, you'll want to make sure that the tumor genome uh, tells you that uh, HER2 overactivity is driving the proliferation. Okay, so this is an example of where uh, pharmacogenomics is starting to be realized. Okay, so another example then is, uh, again, monoclonal antibodies, okay, and there are two monoclonal antibodies which target the same target, so I'm going to put them together. So cetuximab uh, is one, and then the other one is panachumumab, okay, right, so both of these monoclonal antibodies are used to treat colorectal cancer, okay. And um, their target is very similar to trastuzumab. Instead of HER2, their target is HER1. Okay, however, HER1 has a more common name. HER1 is known as the epidermal growth factor receptor, and it's just written EGFR, standing for epidermal growth factor, and then receptor. But you can, if you want, call this HER1. It's the same thing. Okay, so, um, cetuximab and panachumumab bind to the epidermal growth factor receptor, or HER1, and just like trastuzumab bound to HER2 and blocked the epidermal growth factor from being able to bind to HER2, these drugs will block epidermal growth factor from being able to bind to EGFR. Okay, now, this is only useful in colorectal cancers where the overdivision is being driven by epidermal growth factor receptor rather than by downstream pathways. Okay, so let me draw a little diagram here. So I'll draw a cell here. Okay, and let's say this is some colorectal cell. Okay, and of course it wouldn't really be this shape. If it was an epithelial cell, it would be uh, columnar shaped. Okay, uh, but just for the principle of a diagram, we'll draw it like this. Okay, so in colorectal cancer, usually it is the epidermal growth factor receptor pathway that is driving overproliferation of the cells, but it might not necessarily be the epidermal growth factor that is causing it. So let me explain this. So if we have the epidermal growth factor here, so let's say this is EGFR here. Basically, when epidermal growth factor binds to the epidermal growth factor receptor, what ends up happening is first the two epidermal growth factor receptors dimerize. Okay, so I draw a little um, picture here. So this is the epidermal growth factor binding to the epidermal growth factor receptor here. Okay, and then what will happen is it will change the conformation of the epidermal growth factor receptor. You'll get this dimerization of um, the epidermal growth factor receptors. Okay, so here is another epidermal growth factor receptor here in blue that has also got epidermal growth factor bound to it. So this is this little molecule here in green. 
and then the dimer will then trigger an intracellular signaling cascade that I'm not going to go through the full details of. However, it involves the activation of a protein known as KRAS. Okay, now there are multiple forms of RAS proteins. KRAS is a specific one that is usually uh, involved in colorectal cancers. Okay, there's also NRAS and other forms as well. Okay, but KRAS is the form that's very important in uh, colorectal cancers. Okay, so usually then what happens in colorectal cancers is that some component of this signaling cascade is overactive. Okay, so KRAS is a component of this signaling cascade, and this signaling cascade overall leads to growth. Now, okay, we are proposing to use this drug, so tuximab or panitumumab, which effectively uh, are monoclonal antibodies that act as antagonists of the epidermal growth factor receptor. They block the epidermal growth factor from binding to the epidermal growth factor receptor. Okay, that is only going to stop colorectal cancer cells over-proliferating if the problem in this pathway is on the level of the epidermal growth factor receptor. Okay, if the, for instance, the problem as it usually is, is on the level of KRAS, okay, so an activatory mutation in KRAS, okay, and many, many colorectal cancers do have activatory mutations in KRAS. If you have activatory mutations in KRAS, then KRAS will be driving the portions of the pathway downstream of it here and will be leading to growth. But it doesn't matter if we antagonize the epidermal growth factor receptor because the KRAS doesn't need the epidermal growth factor receptor to be activating the pathway anymore because it's got this activatory mutation generally, which means that it's always on, basically. Okay, so if you have colorectal cancer where the cells have activatory mutations in KRAS, then there is absolutely no point in the world of giving cetuximab or panitumumab because it's not going to have any effect because the activation of this pathway is downstream of the epidermal growth factor receptor. Okay, so these drugs are only going to be used in colorectal cancer cells where KRAS does not have an activatory mutation, okay, and then it's more likely that the problem with this pathway is overactivation of the epidermal growth factor receptors, and therefore these monoclonal antibodies would be useful. Okay, so again, um, before these drugs are prescribed, you would take a biopsy of the cancer uh, and you would look to see whether those cancer cells have activatory mutations in KRAS. And if they do, then there's no point giving these drugs. If they don't, then these drugs could be given and they will probably be effective. Okay, so again, this is an example of looking at genomic information, again, the tumor genome here, and working out which drugs to give based on which ones are actually going to be effective rather than just giving a drug uh, in a one-size-fits-all um, way. Okay, right. So that's Cetuximab and Panitumumab. My final example is actually probably even more famous than Trastuzumab, okay? We're going away from monoclonal antibodies now. We've seen Trastuzumab, Cetuximab, and Panitumumab. We're now going to go on to what's known as small molecule inhibitors. Okay, and the small molecular inhibitors that we're going to uh, see are specifically the ones which inhibit the tyrosine kinase made by the BCR able fusion product. Okay, so uh, these drugs are used to treat certain forms of leukemia. Okay, and I'll give you the names of them first. So there are two main ones. So the first one is imatinib, okay, a very famous drug. And then another one is dazatinib. Okay, right, so what are these used to treat? Well, they're used to treat certain forms of leukemia that contain what is known as a Philadelphia chromosome. Okay, now the main form of leukemia that contains this, but not the exclusive form of leukemia that has one of these in, is what's known as chronic myeloid leukemia, or CML for short. So this is chronic myeloid leukemia. So let me now explain to you what a Philadelphia chromosome is, and then I'll explain to you what the BCR able fusion product is and how these drugs are going to work to stop it. Okay, so 
Chronic myeloid leukemia then results in the formation of something known as a Philadelphia chromosome. Okay, so let me explain what this is. Okay, so a Philadelphia chromosome is made uh, by the translocation of a portion of chromosome 9 and chromosome 22. And by the way, it's called a Philadelphia chromosome just after the city where it was first discovered. Okay, so that's why it's called that. So, let me draw a picture of chromosome 9 and chromosome uh, 22 here. So, let's say this is chromosome 9 here. And remember, when you look at chromosomes, when they're compacted like this, and they're only compacted like this for a very short period in the cell cycle, okay, but when you're lucky enough to see them like this, they have a short arm and a long arm. And the short arm is called the P arm, and the long arm is called the Q arm. Okay, so this is chromosome 9 here, and then chromosome 22 is much smaller, so I'll draw that here. Okay, so this is chromosome 22, this is the P arm, and this is the Q arm. Now, a portion of the Q arm of chromosome 9 is going to exchange for a portion of the Q arm of chromosome 22. Okay, so basically you're going to chop this portion off, chop this portion off, and exchange them between the two. Okay, now, importantly, at the bottom of this portion of chromosome 9 that's going to be translocated onto chromosome 22, you have a portion uh, known as um, the Abelson 1 portion. Okay, so this is called Abelson 1. And then, at above the portion where you're chopping chromosome 22, okay, you have a portion known as the BCR. Okay, so this is the BCR, which stands for the breakpoint cluster region. So BCR stands for breakpoint, that's the B, and then cluster region, not B cell receptor, don't confuse that. Okay, breakpoint cluster region. Okay, and by the way, Abelson 1 is usually abbreviated down to ABL or ABL. Okay, right, so what's then going to happen when we translocate this portion of chromosome 9 onto this, with this portion of chromosome 22, is that we're going to get this new chromosome 22 formed, okay, which is made from this bottom portion of chromosome 9 here, and then the rest of chromosome 22. And then what ends up happening is you join this breakpoint cluster region portion with Abelson 1 here, okay, so the BCR portion gets fused with the ABL portion. And this creates a new gene, because now what happens is these two bits are transcribed together and then translated together to create a whole new protein. And this whole new protein is then called BCR ABL. Okay, now, BCR ABL is then a tyrosine kinase enzyme, and which is permanently on and drives the cells to proliferate far too fast, okay? So this protein is incredibly uh, pro-proliferation. It causes cells to divide very, very fast. Okay, right. So before we go any further, let me just say that this new chromosome that you have here, which is made from the top portion of chromosome 22 and the bottom portion of chromosome 9, this is what's referred to as the Philadelphia chromosome, and this has the bcr able fusion portion uh, on it. Okay, so the Philadelphia chromosome makes a protein called bcr able and this is a tyrosine kinase enzyme which drives the cell to proliferate. Okay, so this causes proliferation. Now, uh, this is found in many different forms of leukemia, but the principal one that it's found in is chronic myeloid leukemia, and it's responsible for the cells uh, dividing too fast, basically. So the idea is, then, this is a ideal target. This is only found in these cancerous cells. It's not found in any other cells in the body. Okay, so if we could create a drug which specifically targets BCR able and inhibits it, that should just take out the cancer cells and not damage other cells of the body. Okay, so this is the ultimate example of targeted cancer therapy, where you are literally just targeting uh, a molecule that is found only in these aberrant cancer cells. That is what imatinib and dazatinib both are. They are drugs which inhibit BCR able. Okay, so basically, what would what would happen is 
If you have a form of leukemia, we would look to see whether this form of leukemia is being driven by uh, BCR ABLE. If you have this genetic marker, which is that you've got BCR uh, and ABLE fused together, i.e. if you've got a Philadelphia chromosome like so, then uh, we can say that these drugs might be very effective in uh, reducing the proliferation of the cancer cells. Okay, right. There's a further correlate of this, which is that dazatinib should not be used in certain Philadelphia chromosome-driven uh, uh, forms of leukemia. Okay, specifically, if the BCR able fusion gene here has a certain mutation in it, okay, and this mutation is specifically threonine at position 315 to isoleucine, okay, so a substitution mutation where if I draw the protein here, so let's say this is the BCR able protein just drawn as a polypeptide that's unfolded at the moment, then if this is threonine at position 315, what you've done is you've changed that to an isoleucine. Okay, so it's just a simple substitution mutation. If you have this substitution mutation, then it means that dazatinib is no longer functional. Okay, so basically, before prescribing dazatinib, you want to make sure that the Philadelphia chromosome BCR able fusion gene doesn't have this mutation because otherwise the dazatinib is not going to be functional. So then again, it's another example of personalized cancer medicine where we firstly look at the genome of the tumor and then decide which drugs are actually going to be effective against that tumor. Okay, right. So that now concludes our discussion of personalized cancer medicine.